this is a very worthwhile, it's a very worthwhile area of um, research and clinical work because if you can change an adolescent for the better, you change them like for the rest of their life. Dr. Lori Calabresi, a psychiatrist at Innovative Psychiatry, has tremendous experience using metabolic interventions to treat mental illness. But a lot of what we know comes from research and clinical experience in adults. But what about adolescents and teenagers? Well, it turns out Dr. Calabresi has some experience there as well. So let's hear about the unique challenges and opportunities of dealing with this population and how it compares to her experience with adults. Here's the interview with Dr. Lori Calabresi. Welcome to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, transforming the study and treatment of mental disorders by exploring the connection between metabolism and brain health. Thank you for joining us on this journey. All right, Dr. Lori Calabresi, thank you for joining me once again at Metabolic Mind. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Brett. We, we've talked a number of times, and you know, there's a lot of research going on in clinical experience and of using ketogenic therapies to treat serious mental illness. And the majority of it is in adults, both the research and the clinical experience. But you've, you've talked about and even written about um, treating adolescents um, and not just adults. And, and I'm curious about your experience with that because you know, adolescents aren't just little adults, right? They're completely different, different hormones, different life structures, so many different things. So what is your high level um, just take home of treating adolescents versus treating adults with ketogenic therapy for mental illness? High level, it's yeah. actually about getting the whole family on board with both parents, or if it's a split parent um, household, at least both parents aware of and able to consent mm -hmm. to helping the adolescent. Um, that's the first thing. The second is engaging the adolescent. Yeah. So it's critical, more so than with medicine, and more so than I think even with other treatments in psychiatry, getting an adolescent to get excited about this kind of treatment is really um, key to getting the treatment to work. Third high level thing, understanding the adolescent's learning style. Mm -hmm. That's something we don't talk about in psychiatry, but teachers know this very well. There's differentiated learning and differentiated teaching. Some kids respond better to visuals, info, communication, written instructions. Yeah. And so figuring out how does this kid learn is gonna be really important because we're gonna wanna teach that patient um, all about this so that they can be really successful. And I think probably the, the last thing is having a really good dietitian to work with adolescents, more so than any other patient group that I see. They're growing. They have sports in different seasons. There are hormonal changes that we have to take into account. And there's all kinds of social things mm -hmm. that we can really help them with when we help them ketify what they want to do with their friends and what they want to eat with their friends when they're on this kind of treatment. Yeah. So. I think that's a great overview. And you, you talked about having them buy in, really getting them to, to be excited about it. And I imagine that's a ch that can be a challenge for, for a lot of adolescents. And, and so what, are, what do you do to do that? Like, how do you really get in to reach them? I think it starts with the first visit because yeah. it's usually the parent that's calling. And so if I'm meeting with an adolescent and one or two parents, or we're on Zoom with an adolescent and one or two parents, um, very often the, the most um, troublesome thing for an adolescent is to, <laughs> I think, so, is to hear their parents talk about them. Yeah. So, so often what I'll say is, I'm gonna ask your mom and dad actually to tell me about what you used to be like. Mm -hmm. Last time you were in a really good place and what they saw change and then we're gonna throw them out of the room. And I wanna ask you the same thing. Yeah. So to have someone, even if they're very fragile, listen to themselves being described, sometimes it's the first time they've ever heard their parents say what they used to be like and mm. then say what changed. Um, the buy-in happens when the parents leave the room. Yeah. And then I say, you've heard this, tell me a little bit about that. What if we could give you a way back? Mm -hmm. So. Um, very often adolescents coming to me aren't coming to me. This is not their first rodeo. They've been in treatment, they've seen people, it hasn't worked, or they haven't wanted meds, or yeah. they've been hospitalized. And so coming to this kind of treatment is 
something that they do when they're tired or mm -hmm. they're sick and tired and they're still yeah. young. They're 15, they're 16, they're you know, 17. Yeah. And you know, I probably should have started with this question, but even though we're you know outside of the realm of research, really, do you think ketogenic therapy is as effective in adolescents as it is in adults for for treating psychiatric conditions? So this is based on my own on your clinical own on my own yeah. experience. I think it's actually more effective. Wow! Because there is all of this opportunity, young, to model something and to actually get someone feeling very good very quickly. It, it ketogenic therapies are really easy for adolescents to adopt because they're often not fighting metabolic disorders or weight mm. that would not, maybe have an adult go into ketosis a little bit more slowly. So when they're in, it's easy. Um, they. They adapt, they adapt it and adopt it and adapt to it, I should say, in a way that, um, that doesn't create an eating disorder because the family is eating. The mom's cooking. They're all, like the family ends up really doing it, yeah. not making a specific meal for their teenager. They're so invested in wanting to try this that it works for, works for the family, it works for the teen. Yeah. Yeah. And like you led with, so important to get the family on board to really see success. And does the diagnosis matter? You know, we, we talk a lot about uh, bipolar disorder and major depression and schizophrenia. And imagine the teenage population also has ADHD and OCD and anxiety. Do you think the diagnosis matters or do they all fall under conditions that will respond to ketogenic therapy? It's a loaded question. Yeah. Right? It's a question that we don't have. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any easy for. questions. <laughs> Come on. Give me the hard ones. <laughs> so what I can tell you that we've treated in our practice is first episode psychosis, major depression, um, bipolar disorder with both um, episodes of you know, mania and depression, patients who've had autism, OCD, anxiety. There's been a cluster and ADHD is in there because mm -hmm. most of the patients that I see don't have one thing. Right. right. What distinguishes ketogenic metabolic therapy is that it's a treatment that I think biologically is so powerful that it gets at underlying mechanisms in all of these conditions, right? So the question is, well, how do you flex it then? What do you do with it in an adolescent who has a first episode of psychosis, who hates their medicine, whose parents mm -hmm. say, can, can we get her off medicine or taper her medicine or do something? And is that different from what you would do with someone who has such severe OCD mm -hmm. that she can't go to school or he can't go to school? Mm -hmm. So we're working out what the ketones need to be, what the ratios need to be, what the measures need to be, and following that over time. But I think um, this is a very worthwhile, it's a very worthwhile area of um, research and clinical work because if you can change an adolescent for the better, you change them like for the rest of their life, Yeah. right? right. And then maybe the medicine that they thought they were gonna need to be on for their whole life, they all of a sudden aren't on anymore. It changes everything. And you can change their education, their first job, their whole, their They're, relationships, their entire, the entire They can have life. a girlfriend, yeah. they can get a boyfriend. Right. It's the, it's, yeah, it's all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Which speaks a lot to that, the social structure. And you talked about the need for support and a good dietitian. And when your friends go out for, you know, pizza and beer, if you're in college, or if you're, you know, in high school and your friends go out for pizza and milkshakes or whatever, like, what do you do? And what you need to have the knowledge and the structure ahead of time to know what to do. So is that where working with your dietitian is so crucial or how do you help them navigate that? I think we start with a dietitian up front yeah. and most of the meals start at home, right? They, it's, it's easier to control that if mm -hmm. mom and dad and the adolescent or the kids in the family know what the meal structure is gonna be. But a, an important part of that is that so many people who have heard about keto on YouTube or in other places buy keto foods. Yeah. And so they don't even know, they come to us saying, we're, can you help us because we're doing a ketogenic diet but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes my dietitian and I will sort of look at each other and say, I, I don't think that's keto, no. <laughs> you know? We have to find a nice way to say, let's, let's make sure that a ketogenic diet is actually gonna produce ketones, mm -hmm. right? So um, as they learn what they can have, then we start to show them how they can flex out, we look at menus with them. 
my dietitian is really wonderful at coming up with creative recipes for somebody who says, I need to have Alfredo sauce. I want Alfredo. <laughs> so, you know, we are looking and creating and modifying things and often we're modifying their family's favorite foods. So if they've got some favorite foods and we just need to make them keto and get something um, out of the menu that, you know, would otherwise be there, we find a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like there are a lot of clinicians who dismiss ketogenic, ketogenic therapy, just dismiss it out of hand, that no one's going to stick to it, so why try it? And that they would say that about adults, and they would just say that even more emphatically with, with adolescents and teenagers. In your experience, have you seen that they will stick with it if they see benefits that they're sticking with it, or is it still a, a, a challenge in terms of compliance and adherence? No, I've seen them stick with it. Yeah, yeah I've seen them stick with it to you know a, a young um, person with the first episode of psychosis who's totally off of his totally off of his antipsychotic and buff. So his friends all want to know, like, <laughs> what you do, right? And um, and as they stick with it, they find once they once they are well or well enough that the, they say they're they're well, they're happy. Then they want to know, like, how far can I go? Like, what can I do? How yeah. far can I flex? And really, the the key to that is figuring out: Gee, do your symptoms come back? Mm -hmm. Let's check your ketones. Or if you want to go out, how can you correct and get back into ketosis a little bit more quickly? If you're out with your friends and it's pizza night. Yeah. Right, and then we can just kind of like quickly get you back. But that depends on first getting into ketosis and then getting metabolically flexible. Mm -hmm. So what we do is try to teach teens like we would teach adults. You've got to get to the point where your body can switch on a dime. Yeah. That's going to take four months, mm -hmm. like four months. Can you give it four months? Yeah. And so, and then when they see it, then their friends want to know what, what they're doing. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's so interesting. We've, we've, we definitely have heard examples of people who are in ketosis Monday through Friday and then come out Saturday and Sunday and do whatever they want and then come right back on Monday and they do that just fine. But if they extend maybe for a long weekend, they start to see symptoms start to come back so they, they learn where their threshold is. And others, if their ketones fall below two, they get symptoms, right. right? So everybody's a little bit different in that area. So I'd imagine that takes a lot of sort of handholding and education to really make sure someone's safe when they do that. And, and willing to look. So yeah. you, if you have somebody who's willing to say, let me see, and then we've got the data that, and the graphs that show, oh, like, wow, you look at how good you look and your ketones have been like in a good place and oh, like what was, like what happened there? Sometimes it's not so clear if someone's a little, a little out of ketosis or ketones fall for um, a day or two, they might not really um, know for another day yeah. that, that, oh, it's gonna catch up with them. Mm -hmm. So everybody learns their own little pattern and then very often they think it's not worth it to me. Yeah. Like, I know what I was like. I know where I used to be. Yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the, the, the barriers of someone starting therapy or the hesitancy of a, of a clinician even recommending it. Do you think those are stronger with um, a clinician sitting in front of an adolescent patient versus an adult patient? And what would it take to sort of break those barriers down? Oh, I think they're a lot stronger. Yeah. The biggest, the biggest barrier is that... Um, this is an off-label trial mm -hmm. or an off-label treatment on a kid, Yeah. right? So all of the warning signs go up, both for the parent, and sometimes for the adolescent, and yeah. certainly for the doctor and the clinician. So what what is very um, different about this kind of treatment in adolescents is at this point, parents are calling us. Parents are calling clinicians saying, please, can you try this? Please, this is an, an option. I don't want medicines. I don't want my... I don't want my daughter to become like me. I'm, I'm on three different things. I don't want my son to become like his uncle. His uncle's never gotten out of the hospital. He's so, so there is an automatic hope on the part of parents coming in. And I think then it makes the conversation about this is off label. Mm -hmm. This is, this is really the recommended treatment. I know you've tried it. I know your, your child might be on it or maybe on it, but is unwilling to take it. So lots of, just lots of um, opportunity to discuss what does that mean? And unlike with medicines, with a ketogenic diet, there is no PRN. You don't just like take a swig of olive oil. Meaning as <laughs> needed, take as it needed. as needed. Take yeah. it as needed. You don't say like, 
oh, I'm having a panic attack. What can I, where's yeah. my panic attack medicine right. for that? Or I'm having psychosis. Where's my psychosis medicine? Right. So you have to be willing to work both with medicines if patients are on them and tapering and as needed medicines, or with patients who say, I don't want anything. You've got to come up with then what? Then mm -hmm. what if you don't feel well? And what are you going to do? What am I going to do? How are we going to talk about it? How are we going to get you feeling better? Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's a, a, a good tour of um, ketosis for adolescents, the challenges, but also the, the opportunities. I mean, I think it really is a, a whole population that could benefit dramatically. And I'm, I'm glad you're out there doing the work and you really are trailblazing for this. And hopefully others will follow suit and the research will, will follow as well. And the research will be right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you.